Hi, I'm Eric Ford for Made Here. Waterbury, Vermont filmmaker Vince Frankie teamed up with the Lake Champlain Basin Program and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to share the history and restoration efforts of landlocked Atlantic salmon in Bringing Back Salmon. This documentary weaves together stories of community efforts to improve river habitat through an important dam removal, salmon research, educational projects, and current restoration efforts. This film hopes to shed light on the mutual benefits between good salmon habitat, flood resiliency, and clean water in Vermont. For more about lake and water health from Vince and Vermont PBS, check out Saving Our Waters, streaming now, or another new film from Vince called Nebi, Abenaki Ways of Knowing Water. Watch on broadcast or streaming at vermontpbs.org. Enjoy the film, and thanks for watching. Landlocked salmon have plied the waters of Lake Champlain and its tributaries since the Ice Age glaciers retreated from the Champlain Valley more than 10,000 years ago. At least eight rivers supported large salmon populations that provided abundant food sources for Native Americans and early European settlers. But increasing human pressures had significant consequences for salmon and the species was extirpated by the mid-1800s. Since the 1990s, a partnership of federal and state agencies, local businesses, universities, and watershed organizations has worked to develop a better understanding of a complex ecosystem and restore salmon habitat. Mid is 0 0.16. Citizen involvement and new and innovative research have led to improved knowledge and recent conservation successes. The work has helped restore a popular fishery and resulted in natural reproduction in two rivers for the first time in 150 years. However, challenges associated with invasive species, habitat quality, dams, and optimizing the use of hatcheries still remain. This could literally be the best fishery on Lake Champlain, salmon-wise. Until now, there's been a dam on this river for uh, one way or the other for the past 200 years. It was quite a decision. There was, there was a lot of uh, discussion. The Boquette is very closely tied to the history of Willsboro. The reason that this was settled and was the first town in Essex County settled was because of the falls, water power. From the very beginning, in the 1760s, they started putting dams up. The oldest record that I can find of the dam being in place was about 1813. The Boquette River was an important source of water power and also an important source of food for Native Americans and early European settlers. During the Revolutionary War, they were able to take pitchforks and capture hundreds of salmon at a time in the fall when they were running up to spawn. They would utilize those for food for the soldiers. Landlocked Atlantic salmon likely arrived around 10,000 years ago, after the Ice Age glaciers receded and an arm of the Atlantic Ocean stretched into the Champlain Valley. With the weight of the glaciers removed, the Earth's surface began to slowly rise cutting off the Atlantic's reach into the valley. After becoming isolated from the ocean, salmon in the newly formed Lake Champlain evolved independently from the seagoing population. When Vermont and New York became more in, um, settled, there was much more use of the land for agriculture and there was much more use of the river for power. There was more sediment that hit the river there was blockages of the salmon runs, and so the salmon runs started to disappear. Atlantic salmon were eradicated in Lake Champlain probably in the 1800s at some point. We don't know a specific date. Back in the 1960s or 70s, there were some initial attempts at salmon and lake trout restoration on Lake Champlain. So the life history of the salmon is it's born in the river and then it migrates out to the lake, usually when it's around two years of age. And then it would come back as an adult around age three or four years of age, back to the river where it was born, so it would home back there and start that whole cycle over again. 
So salmon really need a lot of interconnected habitats. Those initial plantings provided a bit of a fishery and uh, we did see some salmon returns coming back to some of the tributaries like the Boquet River. After these early initiatives, restoration efforts were focused on river systems with the best potential for salmon habitat. The dam at Willsboro provided one of the biggest obstacles to a self-sustaining salmon population in the Boquet River. It's a beautiful river. It has everything you need for self-sustaining salmon population. These historic dams, especially those that are no longer serving any functional use, it's a great thing, generally speaking, to take them out where we can. I'm 75 years old. I've been here all of my life. I've seen the, uh, the river for many, many years. When I was a student in school, we used to play on the river during the winter. I kind of uh, hated to see it go. Then we started having uh, hearings, having meetings, and uh, both sides explained their viewpoints. It was quite a decision. There was, there was a lot of uh, discussion. Probably the best thing that we did was had Malone and McBroom do us a, a, a demonstration of what it would look like afterwards. Honestly, I use that as an example all the time. Change is difficult. Um, so it, it was an education. It was, it, was, it was a whole process, but eventually I think people came around. And we took the time to go to public meetings. I think that's what it took. Basically, the Planning Commission and the Essex County Soil and Water and the local Trout Unlimited chapters did all the heavy lifting. Uh, one thought process I had was, well, I'd like to conserve the dam, uh, but e even as a historian, you have to realize that sometimes that's not practical. You, you have to make changes. It really didn't hit until the f we had a final public hearing. Everyone got up and said, well, I used to be against it, but now I'm for it. I think we should go ahead. The waterfall is perhaps more beautiful now than it was when the dam was there, you know. Now we see it going down over the rocks. It's good that the dam is gone. It really is. With that dam removal, it opens up about 14 miles of the Boquet River main stem. And uh, depending upon how you count, that could be upwards of 75 miles of river that's opened up to potentially spawning salmon. From a town's point of view, we look at it from, from, from an economic development point of view. Fishermen love the salmon, and if we can, we can expand the sport fishery, it helps the town economically. By removing the dam, it also decreased the temperature of the river, which is good for the ecosystem, addressed uh, global warming issues. Ice dams used to build up behind the Willsboro Dam and cause for a lot of flooding in the town of Willsboro. And so by removing the dam, it actually decreases the probability that those types of floods will, will occur in, in the future. I'm super excited about the fact that the salmon are naturally getting over the falls now. That's one of the major goals of the whole project, and to see it start to happen actually sooner than most people thought it would is really, really neat. For somebody in local office, there's very few things that are victories, and to me, this was the right vision and carried out the right way, and um, I'm very proud of it. One community's decision to remove a dam demanded a collective reimagining of its identity. Removing this barrier opened more than 70 miles of salmon habitat in just one step. Along with dam removals, salmon restoration needs a combination of research and management. Salmon were extirpated in Lake Champlain in the 1800s. Since the 1970s, hatchery programs have been implemented annually to stock Atlantic salmon within the service system with the hopes of developing a self-sustaining population. After those initial attempts proved successful, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation got together with the Vermont Department of Fish and Wildlife and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and made a more cooperative and coordinated effort at restoration attempts. When you think of Atlantic salmon, it's sort of a keystone species, an indicator species. It's just a really neat thing to have in the watershed. I grew up in Vermont and some of my first memories are fishing on Lake Champlain, you know, with my father. Knowing that we're restoring a, this Atlantic salmon species back in the lake is just truly great. Salmon restoration has been complicated. 
Even successes like the first natural reproduction in 150 years brings new questions and challenges. A partnership of federal and state agencies, local businesses, universities, and community organizations has provided a better understanding of the complex ecosystem and improved restoration efforts. The sea lamprey control program is almost like the foundation of the salmon restoration program. Sea lamprey larvae grow up in streams and head out to the lake as adults, where they attach to salmon and other fish species, resulting in wounding and often death of the fish. Sea lamprey control and trapping efforts target the juvenile lamprey in the rivers in the fall and returning adults in the spring. Without proper management of that population out there, we wouldn't have the survival of the adults. Our goal is to get the lampreside into the concentration we want across the whole water column. As that's going on, we have a, a lab set up so that we can monitor the concentration and ensure that we're delivering a effective and safe treatment. Before the program, uh, what salmon or lake trout we did find in the lake, uh, we found wounding rates of close to 80 or 90 wounds per hundred fish. And now that we've controlled sea lamprey for a number of years, now we're down to wounding rates for salmon of 15 to 25 per hundred fish. And that's a huge reduction and that really impacts the survival of those salmon. The Lake Champlain restoration program really relies on stocking of salmon in the lake. We've established uh, a decent fishery on the lake, uh, but we are um, continue to improve on our techniques. We're uh, employing different methods and projects to monitor the progress of the fish that are stocked in the lake. We have two water sources here, a well water source, which is fairly constant, and our surface water from Furnace Brook. We thought the natural temperature regime was uh, important for the, the development of the smolt, so we decided to take our landlocked salmon uh, late in the season and expose them to that colder water uh, from January through um, stock out in April. Uh, it resulted in a somewhat smaller fish, but a uh, fish that was more suited for stocking in the tributaries and returning as adults. We did realize a three-fold increase in comparison with the well water fish. Through these management actions, we find what works the best and we adapt our strategies to help refine and improve our ability to produce better salmon runs. We hopefully encourage more salmon to spawn naturally. For six years, we stocked equal numbers from eggs from returning feral adults and equal numbers of fish that were reared from eggs produced from the domestic brood line. Tag number 2929. Male. We found that fish that were out in the wild returned in greater numbers than, than did the fish produced from the domesticated broodstock. The introduction of alewife, a forage fish, to Lake Champlain in 2003 is another significant challenge for salmon managers. Salmon end up eating these alewife, they end up developing a vitamin B deficiency. What ends up happening is the eggs produced by the salmon when they're vitamin B deficient end up having neurological abnormalities. It was questionable for a few years about whether or not they would even be able to reproduce at all. Efforts are underway to understand the impact of vitamin B deficiency on natural reproduction and fry survival in the wild. Potential solutions include developing a vitamin B deficiency tolerant broodstock in the hatchery. So essentially, we snorkel and do electrofishing in these areas to go look for their juveniles. And the goal is to quantify the reproductive success by doing a parentage analysis and uh, trying to link the juveniles to the parents. So it's really encouraging that we're finding fish here because it does mean that they can naturally reproduce. Scientists identified natural origin fry in the Winooski River in Vermont in 2016 and the Boquette River in New York in 2017. These were the first naturally reproduced fry in Lake Champlain in 150 years, a significant success story in the effort to restore salmon to the watershed.
Lamprey, alewives, and sedimentation all affect salmon populations in Lake Champlain. However, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, in partnership with dam operators, has been investigating other obstacles to viable habitat. Once they come into the Winooski River, the first dam on the river has a fish lift. So in the fall, we can lift those adult salmon and move them upstream above the next two dams. So then they have the whole river up to Bolton Dam, plus all the tributaries to go into in the fall and spawn. So another aspect that we're focusing on is monitoring the survival and movements of the adult salmon after we pass them upstream. We're using radio telemetry to look at the ways in which the salmon move throughout the river, particularly how they um, spawn and how, when they migrate um, up to the river and back down to the river around when they spawn. We've tagged 20 fish so far. We have antennas set up at four fixed sites and then we see when they move past those. Um, and then we use some mobile tracking to see if we can see more fine scale movements. Radio telemetry monitoring provides critical information on habitat needed for reproduction in the upper Winooski River. The effort will also help improve passage at dams by providing data about the movement of salmon downstream to the lake after reproducing. That means the power companies uh, need to maintain passage facilities. We've recently evaluated those passage facilities and we found it was difficult for the salmon to move through because of the, the operations. And so we've been working with the power company with that information we have about how they approach the dam and how they pass through it, either over the spill or through the bypass or through the turbine. And we worked with them to improve their operation at that dam. Strong conservation partnerships, adaptive management, and community support have helped bring river runs of salmon back to Lake Champlain. Efforts to manage rivers that support self-sustaining salmon populations still face many challenges. But growing public understanding and engagement are helping to achieve large-scale river restoration in the Lake Champlain Basin. We do still have quite a bit of work to do in terms of improving our riparian areas or the trees and, and uh, buffer zones alongside of the river to reduce those fines and inputs. Getting that message out to people so they understand the importance of protecting the watershed in general is, is huge. This is something that affects all of us, whether we realize it or not. The health of our streams and the health of our riparian buffers is critical to our state as a whole. The sedimentation that we're trying to avoid is what reduces or degrades salmon habitat. So if we can manage our activity to reduce that sedimentation and therefore improving Lake Champlain and at the same time protecting our salmon habitat. So there's a lot of efforts going on to restore the riparian areas. It is really important for the whole community to be on board. Individuals can play a role in improving water quality. We all live downstream, and I think that we all experience the benefits of these projects. These healthy riparian buffers are filtering out nutrients from our runoff and are holding our soil in place and are providing habitat for wildlife. As we learn more about habitat requirements for salmon in the rivers of the Lake Champlain Basin, it has become clear that a great deal of overlap exists between the needs for salmon habitat restoration and water quality improvement and flood resilience in our communities. Salmon need clean gravels to be able to have their eggs survive and incubate and then to have the fry hatch. So we started to monitor the quality of the spawning sites and we outplanted small boxes of rocks and we buried them at the same level that the salmon eggs would be at. We also looked at how much sediment you know, came into those boxes through time. What we found is that many of the sites were not viable because there was too much sediment. So if there's a lot of input off of roads or urban areas or fields, that will either suffocate the fish or entomb them. Many of the issues that affect salmon have important repercussions for our communities. We're getting increasing property damage from flood events because of increasing storm frequency and intensity. 
So we have a lot of work to do to improve our resilience to flooding and to protect the lake from um, degradation. As unfortunate as it was, I think that Tropical Storm Irene really opened people's eyes to the importance of these healthy forested riparian buffers and the areas that didn't have them, the damage that can be done uh, when a large flood event comes through. And so I think that there's a lot of support uh, for doing more in our watershed and, and we have the opportunity to do that. Many watershed organizations rely on volunteers of all ages to help with projects that stabilize riverbanks. We're trying to plant 410 trees. We planted uh, sugar maple, dogwood, and red oak, so that way the river banks would be stable and it wouldn't cause flooding. I, I belong to the uh, Lake Champlain chapter of Top Limited, and this is one of the things we do to uh, help uh, with the environment, with uh, uh, streams and rivers that are in the area. You know, there's spots along the river here that don't have any overhead growth to kind of hold the river bank together and to protect the water from the sunlight and the heat in the summertime. Basically, I try to contribute and give back to society in some kind of a volunteer basis, you know. <laughs> this is fun for me. Yeah, I enjoy it. In addition, there's been quite a bit of work done on things like cover cropping with lots of farmers. Traditionally, what we would do is, after the corn was harvested, we'd plow that field back up and we'd let it sit there all winter long. As we understand the soil movement more, um, we are changing practices. And we're applying science, so keeping the soil in place during the snow melts and then hopefully during the rains of the spring. That's helping, you know, enrich the organic matter of the soil and keeping the soil in place. All of those practices are gonna reduce the sediment that ends up in the river and therefore protecting the habitat that we do have for salmon and, and brook trout. These healthy riparian buffers are really important for migratory birds as they're moving up on their uh, migratory routes and coming into the Lake Champlain Basin to breed for the season. And the community benefits are, are endless. The increased flood resiliency, reducing erosion, reducing sediment and phosphorus input into our lake these are all things that communities downstream are benefiting from. The success of salmon restoration efforts can be judged not only by numbers of dams removed or fish returning to spawn, but also by greater public knowledge of complex issues with complicated solutions. The Salmon in the Classroom program brings new awareness and enthusiasm to students who in turn share that understanding with their family and community. Salmon in the Classroom is a great hands-on experience that makes connections with the students to the Lake Champlain watershed. Actually seeing the little salmon and having them take care of something that's tangible is, is really more memorable than anything they'll do in a classroom. We are releasing the salmon into Stacy Brook, which will lead them down to Lake Champlain. They can then go either up or down, and it really gives them a good gateway. So we want to touch on ecology principles, environmental issues, and make a local connection. Science can be fun. It's a hands-on, get dirty, have a blast, and they learn to appreciate and try to protect. I learned how the salmon life cycle works and how important our local streams and ponds are, and help the salmon out by giving them a starting place. The New York State Department of Environmental Conservation provides eggs to the 23 participating Adirondack classrooms, while the Lake Champlain Chapter of Trout Unlimited assists with the equipment and logistics. They usually deliver the eggs mid-January. The students sprinkle the eggs over the rocks so they can settle down in. We try to match the river conditions with the tank conditions. They like it cool and dark because in the winter it's dark because there's a sheet of ice on the top. Can you see it moving? No. It's like right there. We have two students in charge of the tank each week. My favorite part was actually taking care of the salmon, cleaning their tank. I enjoyed this project because it was fun to be out and active and releasing salmon that you've raised. I named my fish Roger and Joe. We try to release mid to late April. It does depend on river conditions. All right, there's a few there. 
I think it is more on raising the awareness in the students and then the students' parents, because the students go home and they talk to their parents and their younger siblings. I would say it definitely trickles out into the community. By giving back, we're helping our ecosystem, and we really tried to just focus on how their population had declined and that they really do belong here. So we learned really how um, helping this can really get a greener environment for Westport and Lake Champlain. In the long term, I see a lot of the students who may not be more outdoors oriented uh, take an interest with all the social media and video games. They need to realize that it's unlimited entertainment outdoors. I'm looking forward to releasing them because I like going down to the river and watching, just watching, because I don't go down there a lot. I think that most people in my class are really going to try to help benefit the lake for the rest of their lives. Maybe we can get the salmon population back to where it should be. Strong conservation partnerships, adaptive management, and citizen engagement have helped bring back salmon to Lake Champlain. The work of salmon restoration shares many mutual benefits with efforts to improve water quality and increase flood resilience. Challenges remain in each of these areas, but the ongoing work of resource managers and an involved public will help to ensure clean water, healthy ecosystems, and thriving communities. Healthy salmon populations reflect a healthy watershed and resilient rivers, a worthy goal for everyone to support. Vermont PBS, partnering with local filmmakers to bring you stories made here. For more, visit vermontpbs.org.